So joining us today as our presenter is John Pattison. And John has uh, taken on a role with Strong Towns that's critical uh, to the work that we're doing to advance the movement or the mission of Strong Towns to change the development pattern across North America in order to allow for communities to prosper. And the way that we see a key part of that playing out is by mobilizing people to take action with the message of Strong Towns. And in order for that to happen, we realized it couldn't just be a lone wolf strategy individuals on their own, sitting behind a keyboard, tapping furiously uh, in the comment section in the local newspaper or whatever that looked like, that it actually required and benefits from people getting together. And so out of that, the local conversations program was formed. And John, well, actually, John, you'll have to share how we've had local conversations long before there ever was a local conversations program, which is part of why uh, we've committed as Strong Towns, in part because of member support, we've been able to provide a platform for resourcing and strengthening our local conversations groups wherever they happen to be. And so a special shout out to all of the local conversations leaders that have joined us this morning or this afternoon. Uh, you're awesome. We love what you're doing. We want to support you in every way possible, as well as to others that are interested in it or perhaps willing in time to join a group, uh, maybe not to lead it, but to join it and to help and support uh, the growing movement for change within your community. And so on that note, I'm going to turn it over to John with the caveat that John is not feeling 100%. So we wouldn't even have noticed if I hadn't said anything, but for John's sake, I'm going to let you all know. Uh, so that way, John just feels more assured. And so, John, welcome and thank you. I've been with Strong Towns for uh, three and a half years now. I started actually as our content manager and um, I did that for about two and a half years. And uh, I, I guess, yeah, it, sometime in 2021, I it, communicated to to Rachel and to Chuck that as much as I, I love the content management work, like where my heart was kind of uh, drawing me was was to our community building work. We'd had a great community builder on staff, Jacob Moses, who was here for a long time. He had taken a job uh, working as an executive director for a local nonprofit where he lives in Denton, uh, Texas. And so that position had been, had been empty for a while, and I was kind of feeling drawn toward it. Um, and so toward the end of 2021, before I began, before I transitioned to uh, this full-time community builder role, one of the things that Rachel uh, and I did was we reached out to all of the existing local conversations that were on our local conversations map. We kind of wanted to see um, how they were faring this side of the pandemic, what they had been working on. And what we discovered uh, kind of blew us away. Um, first of all, uh, we were amazed at what local conversations had been doing, largely without a, a ton of direct support from the Strong Towns organization. Uh, they were working on a wide variety of issues. They were uh, acting in a wide variety of, of, of ways or taking action in a wide variety of ways. And we thought to ourselves, and, and then as a whole organization, if this is what local conversations can do, again, largely without direct support from the Strong Towns organization and the larger movement, what is possible for them and what's possible for that larger Strong Towns movement if we actually were able to provide more support? And so that's part of what we did. Uh, that's, that's a big part now of what I do. We spent a lot of 22, 20. 22, excuse me, kind of learning as much as we can about the uh, the best ways that local conversations uh, can be uh, launched and then supported. And I'll get into some of those, those findings here. So what is a Strong Towns Local Conversation? I get asked this question a lot. Um, this is how I have come to formulate the answer uh, over the course of many um, uh, many times being asked this question. A local conversation is a group of people in a particular place who meet to talk about the Strong Towns approach and then put it into action where they live. That's how I would summarize what a local conversation is. As of January 31st, we had 136 local conversations around the United States and Canada. Um, our goal is to have 1,000 local conversations by the end of December 
2026. That is both an ambitious goal and completely within reach. And I'll talk about why. And I'll talk about why we think that is uh, so important. I'll show you what 136 local conversations looks like on a map. This is from, as, as I mentioned, a couple weeks ago. So this is, and so some things have shifted slightly. There are some that I've actually removed from the map because they're no longer active, we discovered, but others that I've actually put put on. Um, and so, but this is roughly what it looks like. And I'll explain what the different colors mean. When I say 136 local conversations, what I'm counting, I'm counting the blue pins and I'm counting the red pins. The blue pins are the local, like the very local, converse, local conversations, the ones that are working in a very particular community. The red ones are more regional. They're working across maybe a county or uh, you know multiple counties. The green ones uh, are actually just Slack channels. Uh, these are, uh, we have uh, public Slack channels that are place related. Uh, and so I wanted people to be able to find those Slack channels in here, but I don't count those towards the local conversations. This is 136. Let me show you now what a thousand looks like. So that is actually a thousand pins. What I did, this is what, okay, this is what a thousand conversations could look like because what I did simply was I found like the largest 800 towns and cities in the US and the largest 200 towns and cities in Canada and I put it into a map. So this is what it could look like. Like but look at this look at this coverage. The reason why we think that 1000 local conversations is actually very attainable one is we have a huge audience. Where our content is reaching 2 million people per year and there is just so much momentum right now for the strong towns movement. But here's another reason why we think that this is totally attainable. This is uh, this is a map of the 542 people who have reached out to us in roughly the last year and asked about starting a local conversation. So each one of these pins represents somebody who raised their hand and said, "I want to start a local conversation where I live." And so there is a huge amount of interest in the broader Strong Towns movement for people who want to connect with other Strong Towns advocates where they live, talk about the Strong Towns approach, and then put it into action where they live. This map does not look that different than this map. And so I find that I find that encouraging. This map is theoretical. This map is really not theoretical. Now, not all of these folks will eventually go on, of course, to uh, to 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 launch a, a local conversation where they live, uh, but each one of these pins represents somebody who does want to connect and get going. And we get it's not unusual for us to get ten or fifteen additional requests per week from people who want to get something started. In fact, I'm getting so many requests now that uh, part of what I do is I actually say, "Hey, I had four people from Fort Worth in the last couple of weeks who want to start something up. I'm going to connect the four of them." Um, and, uh, so that's, that's very, very exciting. So what does a local conversation do? Um, this is not an official answer. This is the, how I've come to think about it. Um, <clears throat> I think of a local conversation as fanning the strong towns movement to life in their community. Um, there's nothing more powerful than an, than an idea whose time has come. And we are more and more convinced every single day that the Strong Towns movement is an, an idea whose time has come. When Chuck comes back from being on the road at a speaking event, he will say very often in the Slack channels to the rest of the staff, I wish you could be on the road with me. I wish you could feel the excitement. Uh, we... I don't know the exact numbers, but every week we're in the event coordination meeting. And I mean, we're probably turning down, like reluctantly turning down six event requests for every one that we can say yes to. Uh, there's just so much excitement right now. And so what I see local conversations doing is finding and connecting the different sparks in their community, adding some oxygen to it and coaxing it to life. Because one of the things that we have discovered as a Strong Town staff, and what we try to communicate again and again to the Strong Town's audience, is that you are not alone. You're not alone in your community. This is one of the biggest fears and challenges that people have 
when they think about starting a, a local conversation, and I'll get to that. But I guarantee, I can absolutely guarantee you that you, unless you live in a town of one, uh, which is, doesn't seem possible, like you are not alone, and I'll explain why. So specifically, what are some things that local conversations uh, do? So they're getting together, they're meeting, they're they're uh, they're talking with one another, uh, and then they begin to take action. We have found that it is especially powerful when when groups are meeting together in person. Um, it's great to have an online presence. In fact, that can be really really useful. But there's something really powerful when groups are getting together, meeting in person. There are groups that uh, uh, some local conversations have working groups. Uh, and then they also have like social hangouts. Uh, and so a lot of them will do kind of a combination of those. They meet every other week. Uh, usually uh, some of them meet monthly. Uh, these groups are getting together. They're learning and educating with one another. They're learning together. They're going through Strong Towns courses. They're going through books, Strong Towns books or Jeff Be Jeff Specs, you know, the new version of Walkable City. Um, they're they're going through video series. They're also teaching. They're sharing videos and articles with people in their community. They're giving talks and speeches. They are giving neighborhood walking tours. Um, Charlotte Urbanists. Uh, I wrote about. Uh, their group for our, our member drive in November, one of the ways that they're educating their community is they, they do public policy power hours kind of on the street level where they're talking about uh, strong towns related issues on the street where people can kind of see around them how these uh, issues are really playing out in real life. Uh, they're hosting documentary screenings. This is a, a picture from Burlington, Vermont. I just wrote an article for them that I think will be published next week. They hosted uh, a documentary where they had 90 people come from throughout the community. This is actually their like the public launch of their group, and they did it in conjunction with a documentary screening about street safety, and they collaborated with other groups to get the word out, and 90 people came. So uh, then you have folks like... Um, like Mason Thompson, who is a city councilor from Bothell and is now the mayor. So local conversations are getting members elected to local office. They're fighting infrastructure projects like highway expansions and unnecessary bridges. Uh, they're conducting do-it-yourself value per acre analyses. They're hosting Q&A sessions with city office candidates. Uh, they're writing op-eds and letters to the editor. Oh, yeah, that's here's an example from the Baltimore Strong Towns group. They've written multiple letters to the editor that have been published in the Baltimore Sun, and then they've actually been contacted by the city to thank them for that letter, like to to uh, for the, their positive advocacy work on behalf of Baltimore. They're undertaking tactical urbanism projects. For example, they're converting excess parking spaces into parklets. They are doing traffic calming. Uh, here's a, a picture from also from the Charlotte Urbanists where they're installing bus uh, installing benches at bus stops to bring dignity to, to transit users and a little bit of comfort. Um, they're helping to bring in strong towns events. Uh, we have uh, a group in Balt in uh, excuse me in Santa Barbara that is working to make permanent the pedestrian only slow streets that people fell in love with during the pandemic. They're beautifying their cities with street trees and public art. They're speaking up at city council meetings, meeting with city officials. They're nominating crashes for our crash analysis studio. Like I, the, the list goes on and on and on. No group is doing all of these things. No group should try to do all of these things. It's all dependent on who's in the group, what their talents and interests are, uh, what the group wants to focus on together, um, and how it uh, and how much time they have. Something else I should mention is some many groups work together on projects, and that is really ideal. But some groups, when they're first getting started, help the individual members on the projects that they're already working on in their community. One example of that is the Strong Towns Portland group that I also wrote about in November. So they're doing so so much. So another question we get is how does Strong Town support local conversations? <clears throat> um, we try to support them as much as we can uh, with Nick Lanada's help, Nick, who is on this call. Like this last year, we created a Discord server specifically for people who are starting or leading local conversations. One of the things that we realize is that there is so much wisdom and experience for the people who are on the front lines, people like James, um, like who are uh, like have wisdom to share. Um, uh, there's a guy, uh, I think his name is Darian. Um, uh, sorry, Darian, if you're on the call, I can't remember, but he's in Nashua. Like he, 
like the the Nashua Strong Towns has a has a guide for new members that is so good that we're going to put it on our on the Strong Town site. Like we want other people to see and benefit from the work that Darian has done. So we wanted to connect leaders with one another. So we do that primarily through the Discord server. Um, uh, we also do Zoom hangouts. Uh, I send out roughly an email a month, maybe a couple times a month with new resources, and then. I'm on the phone all the time with people who are starting and leading local conversations, just kind of hearing the challenges that they're facing and helping them kind of work through those challenges. We And Norm too, like Norm and I really try to make ourselves as available as possible to our members and to people who are on the front lines of the Strong Towns movement uh, with the local conversations. Other ways that we try to support them, like we try to write about them. We try to get them on podcasts. We want to celebrate the work that local conversations are are doing. Uh, this is the article I mentioned about Strong Towns Portland from last November. Um, uh, office hours, I think, is a way that we're trying to help local conversations. Um, uh, we are putting together a series of discussion guides for the, the Not Just Bikes Strong Town series. That'll be out probably next week. Um, that is going to be a really powerful resource. So many people find strong towns through not just bikes, and they're they were, are going to make for great discussions. Um, so we're going to do things like that. We have the Strong Towns Action Lab, which is chock full of uh, resources. I wanted to mention the Strong Towns Academy. Uh, we if we find out that a local conversation is working on something that is related to a course that we've produced, whether that's a one hour session from the locomotive tour, or uh, one of the in-depth courses on housing or transportation or urban design. We don't want finances to be an issue. Like if your group is on the ground doing the work and one of these courses would benefit you, we ask that you, we we just, we want you to let us know. We're going to give you the resources that you need to put this into action. Um, I, I joked the other day that if we're not meeting our Strong Towns Academy budget, it's Norm, it's Norm's fault and mine because we give this away all the time to people who are doing the work. And I actually, I think the board really likes it, if I'm being totally honest. Um, I have this picture here of, of Chuck, Nick, and Adam. Um, this is from an event. Uh, I think it was in Lafayette, the event. Nick is a, a local conversation leader in Zachary. Adam is in Baton Rouge. <clears throat> the reason I put this here is because I mentioned we get so many event requests one of the ways that we are evaluating which events to say yes to and which events to say no to is, are there local conversations in that area who would benefit from an event near them? Could we give a boost of momentum to, to a local conversation group? Um, can Chuck or whoever the speaker is, like, would they have time to meet with local conversations leaders while they're out there? And so we want to support local conversation leaders with our events too. In addition to that, we haven't uh, made this public, but... I think this is pretty much what we want to do. Like we want to start doing more virtual presentations for uh, local conversation groups. Uh, we found that even virtual presentations from Chuck, from Norm, from Daniel, from uh, Rachel, who's on this call, who doesn't know, I don't think, don't think that we've talked about this. Uh, so surprise, Rachel. Uh, this, so that was, a, but a, a virtual presentation from a strong town staff can still can still be really powerful. And so that's something that we're going to be um, doing in in 2023. Go to strongtowns.org slash local. Uh, that's the best place to go to, to see if there's a local conversation near you. Uh, you'll find a link to the map that I mentioned. You, you'll be able to see if there's a, a, a conversation near you. I'll kind of quickly run through the process with you. Um, if you sign in to strongtowns.org slash local, you find out that there's not a group near you and that you would like to start one. You'll fill out a very, very quick little form, your name, where you are, uh, your email address, and do you want, like, do you give us permission to connect you via email with other people who may also be looking to start a group in your area? Once you do that, you kind of get put into an email journey. It's a very, very quick email journey. I think there are five emails. I doubt any of the emails are longer than a hundred words. Uh, just where I, I very, very, uh, kind of briefly kind of walk you through that process, demystify what it takes to start a local conversation, provide a couple of resources uh, that we think are, are, are really, really helpful. Uh, we will put your group on the local conversations map. Uh, what we ask is that you meet at least one time with at least one other person. It is a low threshold, but it's an important psychological threshold. Um, 
Once you do that, not only will we add your group to the map, but then we will email people in your area to let them know that a new group has started. Um, and that way we are emailing with a high degree of confidence that this group, first of all, we know it exists. Second, high degree of confidence that there's momentum. Uh, and so that can be a that can be really, really helpful uh, to give your new group a boost. And to this is what's so this is what's so fun. This is what's so cool about it. When I, I, I send these emails on Thursday, <clears throat> I started doing this in August of last year. Between August of last year and December. Uh, between, yeah, between August and December, I sent out, uh, I think, a total of 22 emails about new local conversations. Those emails went to 1,951 people, which is the equivalent of 4% of our like, like rock solid email list. And what I will say on Thursdays when I do that, I'll get in Slack and I'll say, hey, I just sent emails to people in these six towns or cities, total of 800 people. These are 800 people that no longer that that know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are not alone in their community, and that now whether they sign up to join that the new local conversation or not, they know that they are not alone, and so this is really powerful a really powerful uh, thing that we can do to help support local conversations is to let people on our email list know about this new group. What are some of the common challenges and fears? I'll kind of end with these three and then we'll get into some questions. One of the things that we hear often is that I don't think that there are other uh, Strong Towns advocates near me. Chances are that's not true. In all of the times that I've emailed uh, people on behalf of new local conversations, the lowest number that I've ever found on our email group, on our email list from a community is six. That was actually very, very rare. And I was kind of apologetic. And the person was like, anything helps. Like, that's awesome. That sounds great. We're a small community. Um, so chances are you're not alone. Even among, uh, chances are there are other Strong Towns advocates near you. But there are, uh, and it, okay, but I'll get to why there are other Strong Towns advocates near you who just don't know they're Strong Towns advocates yet. But one other, but a couple of quick ideas. If you do want to find other people who know about Strong Towns, you can check out our public Slack channels. Uh, you can check out our Facebook group uh, and just say, hey, I'm here from uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Is anybody else here? I'm here from Cleveland. I saw that a couple of months ago, and now there's a group going. Um, I'm here from Cleveland. Anyone else from Cleveland? So you can find get in those public channels you know maybe there's even a, a cleveland uh public slack channel and say hey i'd like to get a local conversation group going is there anybody with me that's a way to find people who know about strong towns uh, but here's why you're probably surrounded by allies whether you know it or not because even people who haven't heard of strong towns care about strong towns issues they care about safer streets they care about uh you know walkability and bikeability they care about the, their their town's need for new for more housing for better land use um chances are you are surrounded by people who care about the same things that you do even if they have not heard about strong towns so when we ask folks to meet with one other person at least one time that other person does not have to have heard about strong towns yet all we want you to do is we want you to get together with at least one other person to talk about your hopes for your community, some of the challenges that that they're it's facing, and how a strong towns approach can be used to make that better. Uh, some ways that 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 you can meet these folks if you uh, I don't know if you, if no one comes to mind. Um, this is from an article that my uh, that my colleague Lauren uh, wrote. She she mentioned five different places to meet people. Uh, I'll I'll just talk about quickly three of them. One is as you're walking your neighborhood. Um, walking your neighborhood is obviously a, like a very very powerful. Um, uh, powerful practice. As you're walking your neighborhood, you're seeing people struggle. Uh, you're 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 meeting people who uh, I don't know who are pushing strollers or walking dogs. Um, ask them about you know their experience of the neighborhood, their experience of uh, of navigating your city, and find connection points. Uh, Facebook is a great place to find people, um, whether it's on your town or city's kind of main Facebook. Uh, page or we have a lot of groups who actually got started by starting Facebook um, groups. Uh, they 
what are now sort of full-fledged local conversations started uh, as Facebook groups where people could talk about these issues. Um, and then finally, like show up at local at you know at your local city council meetings, hear what how people what people are talking about and how. And after the meeting, go up to them, introduce yourself and say, like, I can tell that the way by the way that you were that you were thinking, uh, excuse me, I can tell by the way that you were talking that uh like you and I have a lot in common about in terms of our, our hopes for our our place and the, the best way that we can get there. Um, uh, some some tips for starting a strong towns uh, discussion where you live. This is based on an article I wrote back in July 2020. Just some really quick tips. I'm not going to linger on any of them. Like you can start a book club, whether it's with a strong towns uh, book, one of the two strong towns books, or I mentioned Jeff Speck's Walkable City. Uh, you can share an article or an ebook or a podcast. You can start a blog or a podcast or a, a kind of like a hyper local YouTube channel. Uh, we have we've seen a number of people do this uh, even before a uh, local conversation gets going. I mentioned the, a Facebook group. Uh, that's a great way of getting the conversation going. Share the Not Just Bike Strong Town series. Um, uh, we have a free Strong Towns 101 course that's been gone through by I think eight or nine thousand people at this point. I don't I don't know the exact number, but but uh, many thousands. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, just start a regular conversation. If you want to start a Strong Towns conversation, sometimes it helps to just start a regular conversation to find out um, how people are, uh, uh, where people are struggling, where you are uh, in, in your in your community. Another challenge or fear, like I'm not a Strong Towns expert. The other day I was talking with Chuck and he said, John, I think you need therapy. He's like you, you have so much imposter syndrome. <laughs> I've been working for Strong Towns for three and a half years. Uh, I have been following Strong Towns since 2014, and I basically said, like, I'm not a Strong Towns expert, <laughs> and like, so I struggle with this too. Uh, it's even more uh, uh, understandable if you struggle with it. But here's what I want to here's what I want to say. I don't think we actually need Strong Towns experts. I think we need amateurs. I think we need strong towns amateurs. I think we need uh, amateur experts, and I think we need expert amateurs. And here's why: the word amateur comes from uh, a word that literally means someone who does something just for the love of it. An amateur is someone who is teachable and curious and is motivated primarily by that love. It's fine to be an expert if you have that amateur spirit, and so rather than saying I'm not a strong towns expert, like ask yourself: Am I an amateur? Am I a strong towns amateur? Am I an amateur when it comes to my community? Uh, and that will, I think, keep us all humble and uh, teachable and kind of keep us going from, from the right place. And this is one of the reasons why I think that the, the strong towns four-step process is so powerful. Uh, if you remember the, 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 the strong, the four-step process for public investment, step one is to humbly observe where the people around you are struggling so you're actually going into your neighborhood with this amateur spirit step two um uh identify the like the next smallest thing that can be done to address that that struggle uh step three is to do that thing and to do it right now and then step four is to repeat like that is a process that will not only keep things moving in your community and help you and will help you get better uh, excuse me, will help your community get better one step at a time. Uh, but it's also one that will continue to cultivate the, the spirit of sort of the expert amateur. You have everything that you need. I really believe that. This is something that you'll see on the strongtowns.org slash local channel. Like we believe that you have everything that you need to start the Strong Towns discussion to start a local conversation in your community. But the good news is that you, you won't be doing it alone. Um, even if you're the one who raises your hand and says, I want to start something, that doesn't mean that you're locked in for all time as the, as the leader or the point person. Ideally, in fact, you would have a team of leaders like who are uh, sharing the load together. You don't have to, um, you don't have to do it alone. Uh, you won't be doing it alone and you shouldn't try to do it all yourself. And then finally, like, we have your back. This is what I want to share. The Strong Towns organization, the largest Strong Towns movement, we want to come alongside you as much as we can and help you every step of the way. I was kind of lucky here where I live because we have quite a few vocal 
I had spoken to people in our community and I just really connected with them. I saw them active on Facebook and they had their own projects like uh, my good friend, uh, Brad Richard, um, Rick, uh, he uh, had a Facebook blog already. And I said, look, like I think you're starting this group and he was interested. I reached out to a couple more people and everyone was very positive. And so that's kind of how it got started. And um, I actually met him originally when I joined a council committee, which was run by, you know, the council, um, he was there. So that's how I, how it kind of, it all got started and I learned more as time went on. And then, uh, yeah, connecting through community Facebook was a real, like community Facebook pages was a really good way of, of uh, kind of getting a feel on um, who is, yeah, who's active in the community and interested in these sort of things because you see they post on there, they comment on the on like news stories that people share. I'm like, oh yeah, I agree with them. So that's kind of how it started for me. Um, yeah, and obviously as well, I went to uh, one of your meetings, Norm, to get some ideas and that was really helpful to hear how you ran your group. And that's when I was like, okay, so I can kind of borrow some ideas from you. And, and uh, that's obviously if you live near an existing group, that's definitely a great, great one. If you can go and attend one of their meetings, you can see what they do and then kind of use that as a template or inspiration. Um, yeah, so that's how I kind of got started. Um, I just want to say uh, thanks for the presentation, John. Like I find that really, really inspiring because sometimes I am like, oh my gosh, how are we going to get the word out? Or what can we do to get people interested? And now I'm like, oh, wow, documentary screen. That's a great idea. You could even, I'm just thinking now you could even do that on a Zoom meeting. You could just show a video, right? And then afterwards do a Q&A. And then there's no, there's no need to book a space or anything. You just have people show up. So that's really, I feel really inspired by that. So uh, thank you. Um, another one I, I, you know, I struggle with is like kind of, I want to see immediate results. Like I want to create a community and then it's all buzzing and thriving, but that's just not the way it works. You know, you have to be patient. Like that's one thing I really learned. Yeah, you know, I've been in it for the long run. Like, and I think, yeah, it takes a long time sometimes to get going, and that's like super important. Like, it can take like a year, it can even take like a year or, or even more to for ever for the whole uh, place to build up. So, yeah, that's all I kind of. Oh, and maybe one more thing as well as like empowering members. Like I, you know, so people in my uh, in our group, like they have their passionate kind of interests and I try and see what they're doing and incorporate that into our meetings like a couple of them are really uh, passionate about some wetlands that are being threatened by development right now so I just threw it on the agenda we're going to talk about it on next meeting and see how our group could help and mobilize around that as well so yeah that's that's kind of my goal is like it's not my group I'm not it's not James James Hansen's strong towns it's it's the community it's the group's uh, it's everyone has to have a, have a role in it. How I kind of see the group working like best is educating people um, and spread, yeah, like you said, spreading kind of the ideas because then it doesn't matter in a way, it, it matters less that you are personally taking action or it doesn't really matter who is on council, who's mayor, because you end up with the whole community demanding these changes that it do, they have to, they have to happen. So that's how I kind of see it working. Maybe it's a bit idealistic, but that's kind of my take on it is like, as, as a strong times local conversation, if you educate people, you show, you know, you like talk about like uh, do the book clubs or the showing videos and things like that. Eventually you get kind of like a critical mass where people say, I want this in my town. So you don't have to take on that personal responsibility as much. Everybody, I'm, I'm Nick Lenata um, and Zachary in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My journey with Strong Towns got started, I think through the same way a lot of people get started is uh, through the Not Just Bikes YouTube channel. And slowly, I think through, through Strong Towns webcast, got connected with other advocates in Louisiana. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate, fortunate to be a part of a statewide coalition um, but locally, it's it's a struggle for us because it's very, uh, in my state, it's, it can be very difficult to find uh, those these like-minded people. I know they exist in Baton Rouge, but in my small town of Zachary, which is like a bedroom community of Baton Rouge, it's it's very difficult. So our local conversation is literally 
three people. It's just, it's just me, my wife and our friend, Aaron. So yeah, it's, 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 that's how it's going to be in the beginning for a lot of us is that we have to, like James said, we have to be patient. It's what we're trying to do, change the whole American development pattern. And it's going to take decades, honestly, it's going to, it's going to take a long time. So if you're serious about this, you're in it for the long run. Uh, but don't be discouraged. Uh, there, I've already seen a lot of change in just in just the last year. We, I've got asked, I got asked to be to serve on an economic development committee here in here in my town. And so, if you just show up to meetings and talk to your councilmen and women, big things will happen. You will get asked to do things you never thought would be possible. So yeah, just just keep up the work and just keep having meetings. Find those few good allies in your local area. Find people in your state that you can meet with month monthly that we do so you can encourage each other. And join the Discord so that you can talk to us more often. One of the things I would highlight is another way to just broaden the scope of what it means to be involved in leading a local conversations group or participating in one is to consider that there are sort of ancillary benefits, and especially for younger participants, uh, this has been really cool for our community, where I've just made a habit of like, anytime there's a younger person that's either in school or in early in their career, I write reference letters, I give them small projects, I, I'll say, hey, you, anything you write, we'll publish on our site, because it provides a new way for them to um, end up getting op opportunities and in internships or other things like that, that they otherwise wouldn't have. And so it's actually been really cool. A couple of people have gotten scholarships and internships that they otherwise probably would not have based on their credentials. And another uh, person, my co-founder, uh, she's been lining up digital design work that has been happening through Strong Towns Connections. And so I'm not saying that that always happens, but it is actually one of the cool things. If you're like me on the older side, um, I consider myself, I'm almost 40. So I, I'm looking at it differently now. And it's been a neat opportunity to connect with a younger generation of, of people that are passionate about housing and land use and watching stuff that I haven't even come across yet. It's helping me to feel young. And at the same time, I feel like I can provide them some benefit as well. And so I know we have quite a range of, of participants on the on the video chat this afternoon. But also, if you're watching this on YouTube, I mean, jump into a group because sometimes it becomes a platform for new ways to connect within your community, almost, you know, almost without regard to what Strong Towns is doing. It's just about helping people. And as I, I have said before, but I think every Strong Towns local conversations group should have the idea that it is a support group for altruists. Uh, we're a support group for people that are trying to do good within communities. And, and that's not to say we have an exclusive claim on doing good, but it is to say that we are passionately committed to the common good and wanting to find better approaches uh, uh, compared with what we're currently struggling with. It, I have ended up doing a whole lot more than I expected. I would. Uh, it's definitely uh, has, in a good way, it has really just taken off um, <clears throat> in a way that I'm I'm very pleased about. Uh, but it's also sometimes can be quite overwhelming uh, once you start doing this. I mean, and obviously I'm I'm in Baltimore, so it's a larger city than than for a lot of people. Um, but once once you get into this you just start realizing all of the opportunities that keep on popping up to, to do something. And given that I, I've been in this for a little more than six months, I'm starting to now understand that I and we, we can't do everything. So it's, it's more just like trying to pick and choose what the best opportunities are and um, <clears throat> trying to be also broad-based in what we we tackle because i think at least with us and i think probably given what i've seen in the discord with a lot of other groups i think that there's a there's a tendency to be very focused on biking um and i think that that's really i don't think that's a good thing uh, i i think it we you know the strong towns is in my mind the secret sauce of strong towns is the intersection of transportation and land use. Hmm. 
And there's lots of organizations that focus on just transportation and others just focus on land use, specifically when it comes to like affordable housing or, or what other issues or zoning. There's there's not even that. There are many orgs that focus on zoning. Um, but it's the intersection of those two that I think the power comes from. Mm -hmm. And as, as a co-lead of our group, I really try to make sure that we don't pigeonhole ourselves just on like biking and even transit. Um, we It's very easy, I think, for us to focus on transportation because that is what our group encounters as a challenge in our personal lives. Whereas land use issues are a little more academic because they're challenges that um, you really, a lot of people um, suffer from when they are of more limited means. And our, our representation, I think, is, is more middle, upper class. So those concerns are more academic. Um, but I personally think that, at least in Baltimore, they are crucial to our making the city and the region truly strong. Um, so I, I think they really can't be shunted off to the side. They have to be core. That's just my personal opinion. We try to provide resources to our local conversations leaders. John can attest to this. You end up going to every part of the cupboard. Uh, because it's it's different needs different issues in different places, but we've taken the approach within strong towns uh, that we're we're building a, a movement that is powered by a message, but we are not uh, establishing local chapters. So maybe this is one thing that I can help clarify is that strong towns local conversations we do say people can call themselves strong towns Nashua or strong towns Baltimore. Uh, that's fine, but we do want to make it clear that they're not official chapters or they're not licensed entities or they're not uh, under us in some way. We, I think I feel that a question from someone asking, hey, is it possible to like set up group insurance through Strong Towns? And I was like, sorry, like we don't do that in part because we want to be able to focus on that core work of advancing a message and spreading it widely and doing so in a sense from a national platform but at the same time urging people to, to then take it up and act locally because that's a core part of our insight is that all the action has to happen locally national strategies and all of those types of things need to be filtered back down to the local level and that's where the action occurs and so that's been one of the things that we have done and it, it does mean that there's a lot of uh, breadth in the different types of groups. So you may find you're browsing a website and you're like, oh, I don't agree with that group's take on things. Well, that's that group's take on things. And and if it was so blatantly egregious, we would probably at some point have that conversation. But generally speaking, uh, the goal is to have these self-forming units uh, that are being established. Uh, we could call them sleeper cells against the suburban experiment. We The groups, the, our local conversations have a lot of autonomy. Uh, they're inspired by Strong Town's ideas. Uh, some of them are actually our existing groups that have found that they actually align really beautifully with the Strong Town's approach. And so we actually add them to the our local conversation map. Um, but they act with a lot of autonomy and we can't really like kind of like we can't police everyone. And like we just try to be as help, helpful as we can. And just kind of trust that we're being guided by the same spirit and same approach. And to be honest, like I, I've never had to talk to a local conversation and say, actually, the way that you're talking about such and such is not, you know, kind of antithetical to how we would talk about it at Strong Towns. Um, so far, I've not had to do that. Uh, once we, you know, get more and more, I, I can imagine that hard conversation needing to happen. Um, but when I think about the relationship between local conversations, the local uh, groups, and kind of the, the larger Strong Towns movement, and especially the Strong Towns organization, because we believe and now can see that our local conversations are where the rubber meets the road of the Strong Towns movement in a lot of ways, not exclusively, of course, but they are putting these ideas into action. And so... I mentioned that we want to celebrate them in our content, but we're also learning from our local conversations all the time. And so like we want to celebrate the work that they're doing, talk about the work that they're doing in our content, in our message, which is what we're good at as an organization is getting that message out there. Um, so we want to 
Like, yes. So I guess it, my point is that it goes both ways. We want to learn from local conversations and celebrate their work and then continue to produce content and other resources that are going to help the work of that of the local conversations, if that makes sense. For anyone that's interested to check out Kerry Westerbeck's uh, interview that he did about starting up Bopop in Bothell, Washington, I, I continue to say that that was an interview that changed my life because it prompted me uh, to take a similar action to the one that he took. So what uh, in answer to the question that was asked in the chat there, uh, the question that he posted on his Facebook page for his community, I think there's like 30,000 people on the Bothell Facebook page, and there was people that were complaining about new development and new housing and things like that. And so he just said, actually, I kind of like what I'm seeing in my community, or I, I like this. And if you agree, or if you feel similarly, let's meet up and let's talk. And out of that, they they formed Bopop uh, within a few, I think a few months of that, and then over time. And so the irony is that I loved that question as an opener, and it's not the one that I actually used to start the group that is in my city, and yet I, I would recommend it to everybody. But the approach that I took was we had a public hearing debating the restrictions around secondary suites or garden uh, cottages or uh, accessory dwelling units, whatever you call them in your municipality, but a second unit on a lot in a single family neighborhood. And at that public hearing, I spoke up and a bunch of other people spoke up. And every time that I heard somebody I agreed with, which maybe I should have brought in my horizons a bit, but every time I heard somebody that was at least somewhat positive, I would make a note of their name and I looked them up afterwards and I invited them to a meetup on Zoom. It was during the pandemic still. And so it was like, hey, uh, we're going to talk. Let's see what we what we have in common. One reminder or note is that of those nine people that were part of that first Zoom call, only three are still participating in the group at the moment. The rest sort of just lost interest. They're they're available. They would not say that they're disagreeing with what we're doing, but they're definitely just in a different season of life, not able to participate. So the people that you begin with probably won't be the people that you continue with just as things change over time, um, which does touch on Anthony's question about what happens when things go go sleep, uh, go to sleep, but it definitely provides a, a pathway forward for groups uh, to start with just little sparks. Uh, I like what I'm seeing, or I have concerns about this. Uh, one of the benefits of starting around something that you're positive about is that it sets a better mo a better tone, uh, but sometimes you just have to say like, I don't like when my community is on fire. If you agree, let's talk. And that may be one of the ways in which you, you connect with people. Uh, just leave feelers out there to see if anybody uh, finds it. But we're almost at the top of the hour. And so I just want to close and then I'll be able to hang out for just a little while longer as uh, has been the practice. Uh, we call it the after party, after uh, office hours. And so our next session is next Wednesday. And I'm just going to drop this into the chat. Uh, this is with Daniel Harrigus, who is our senior editor at Strong Towns. He is also a fantastic writer, particularly on housing. And so uh, Daniel has agreed to talk, uh, give uh, 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 thought to questions around zoning reform, housing, and the way in which we can uh, reform zoning uh, for a stronger future. It's kind of in the weeds, uh, but it has a huge implica or it has huge implications uh, for the way that we build and sustain our communities. And so that's next Wednesday uh, for all the regulars. I can't wait to see you there again. And then the following week will be a really cool session, especially if you have people that you might suggest this to. Um, if you have anyone that is not yet a member, but interested in this from as either a, a new parent or they're, they have kids that are younger or, or sometimes one of the most uh, passionate people in our group is someone whose son is, is uh, disabled. And as a consequence, he's a, he's has intellectual disabilities. He's in his 30s or 40s, and yet she is so passionate to shape the environment around him in ways that are conducive to his abilities. And and so that is one of the things that we think about in terms of parenting, all of those different topics. So if there's questions that you have about that, uh, that will be the topic on the 22nd. Then just a note: uh, we do have someone line up for the 29th, but I do want to. Uh, stress that the 2nd of March is when Chuck will be back in the hot seat, and he will be talking particularly about lessons for small communities. Not to rule out the interests of big cities, but we want to tailor it to small communities, and then the follow-up session with Chuck in a month's time will be for large cities as well, so trying to take different questions, different themes uh, along that line.
You'll also notice in the chat, I've made available three of the courses uh, that, uh, so if you grab those links and if you go to the Academy, if you sign up with your email, you'll be able to watch those sessions for free. Normally we do have a fee of $25 on them to help cover the costs of having produced them, but I wanted to make those available for you. Uh, there, there are three really excellent uh, course, uh, one hour sessions is essentially what they are. They're one hour webinars uh, that were produced in order to be of, of uh, considerable value for you. Uh, with that, we're gonna close. I, and I am so glad that we've had this time together. I especially want to acknowledge and thank John. Uh, you've been an excellent presenter, uh, sharing tons of insight with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, everybody.